This is our question period. Um, I'm going to run around with uh, the mic. We're going to do that together. So hands up, and we'll run to find you. I s OK, you got one? There we go. Yeah. I was just wanting to get the elephant out the room and ask what your opinions are regarding the new health care uh, stuff that's going on and, you know, they, with this uh, opioid. I'm, I'm looking for a house in Mexico. OK. And, I, and if he builds the wall, I want to be on the other side that keeps the gringos out. And, yeah, and then, uh, and then you also have the, the doctors that are going to be involved, you know, what are their, what's going on in the conversation room? Well, I mean, I, th I think the biggest thing that I'm worried about is the lack of, you know, when we're, we were moving more towards parity, right? I mean, with a substance abuse treatment as well as, as, well as um, you know, uh, 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 mental health. So I, if that goes away, I'm worried. But I don't really know enough about the new, you know, the, the law in process yet to know. All I know is I carry one of these in my pocket. It's naloxone. <laughs> I never used to do that. <laughs> it's an injector. Under the PERS report, it just shows medication that's been given by um, providers, but sometimes they don't show the medication, narcotics that are given by workmen's comp doctors or certain companies. So when we run the curse report, they might be taking medicine, but it's not under the, the guidelines. The other question is, under the UTOX, it just shows you that they're taking medicine. It doesn't show you how much they're taking a lot or a little. It just shows you what they're taking. Opioids. Oh, I wasn't aware that workman's comp doctor um, prescriptions weren't on the cures. I thought they were. I know that the VA isn't. And in the methadone clinic, the methadone we prescribe in the methadone clinic is not on the cures report. But workers' comp should be, don't you think? Workers', workers comp is. Sometimes Indian reservations aren't. The states aren't related. I don't have time for this, but this is what's on your patient activity monitoring report. Okay? And it's, it's a little bit of a lecture. I don't have time for it. But like how to interpret these, because people think they know how to interpret it. There's a lot more information in there. Again, it's like that FedEx trucks. So you got to learn what to look for. I total doses of drugs you know, in the recent past yeah. and over a long time and see, look for trends. Uh, two pharmacies is always a bigger problem than two doctors. I see three or four pharmacies, but I don't have time to talk all about what it doesn't tell you, the consumption. So this is what a PDMP tells you, right? Patient activity report. It doesn't tell you about consumption, consumption profile, amount consumed versus hoarding versus diversion, the route, oral, IV, snorted or smoked, can suspect, but absolutely uh, not die, be able to diagnose things. And um, I can talk about urine drug testing, but that's a whole other complicated topic. So um, I never use that to make a diagnosis. Two, the dipsticks and the cups are only good for a conversation. Never, ever accuse somebody of having something in their urine unless you have the liquid tomography uh, tandem MS. But again, we probably want to get into other topics that people have questions on. Raise your hand here if you have a question. Hi. For better or worse, we are in a, an age where the pill is king, and the public have certain expectations. Um, positive expectancy is an integral part of placebo response. Two pills are better than one. The bright pill is better than the dull pill. So now that we're here, the pill seems very useful in, as, a, as a medium for this placebo effect. I'm not sure, is there a question or? I, mean, I, I appreciate your comment, I agree with you. So that's an argument that, you know, the pill shouldn't take place number five on that list. Well, then just give them placebo then. But that would be, that's unethical. I'm just gonna say, we I have to change the, I'm gonna interrupt, I mean, we have to change that, that belief system. We have to empower people to take you know, be in their bodies. Mo I think the moving is so important. We have this nice uh, learning about pain. If people are passive, they're not with taking a pill. That's we're, we have to change the understanding about how we heal, and it's a it's a deep personal experience. Yeah. Change the narrative, right? I, I, I just want narrative. to add. I want to add something. I forgot to say this. So one is I want to thank the pharmacist here. That's your best friend. 
And unlike the AMA, I don't support not talking to your pharmacist. I'd rather be called 15 times from a pharmacist a day, even if it's nothing, I say thank you. They're important. Education is usually important. And what Anna and somebody talked about is having uh, individuals who've had chronic pain or had, like addicts, 12-step. Well, I have 12-step people in, who are pure chronic pain patients who've suffered from chronic regional pain syndrome. I got 50 people I can call who want to come in and tell my patients once they got off all these pills and maybe are on one pill now and how much better they're doing, how clear-headed they are. I have one patient who came in with her eight-year-old daughter and she's just a darling girl and she goes, well, I talk a lot, you know, I just want to be a doctor. I said, well, I talk a lot, you know, and I became a doctor, maybe a little crazy, but you can be a doctor too. And, and the mother was crying because this eight-year-old was taking care of her because of all the medication she was on. She had three limb CRPS. Well, now she's mother again and taking care of her daughter and she's off all most of that crap. So again, the drugs are not the evil, it's learning, having a whole tool set, quivers, arrows in your quiver. You can't rely just on pharmaceuticals, and certainly not just on opioids. And you gotta do everything. And, and acceptance is a big part. And education and using the patients, whether they're, they're recovered from addiction or recovered from their chronic pain, and that they've accepted it and have a decent life, and using those people to educate your other patients. That's a huge resource I have. And I, and I don't have to pay for it. They volunteer. Oh, here we go. So I look at all of this information about needing to get patients moving, and I come up against this wall, is that so many of them have gotten huge during this time when they've been taking opioids. Their joints are no longer supporting them. So my go-tos of music, dance, yoga, nature, hiking, just, it just, it's impossible. What I, what I then go to is water exercise. There's so little available, and in the past, there were. That was a part of physical therapy. Um, but, I, I mean, I, it's, it's a huge expense to have pools and to have warm pools and to have them indoors, but that's the only thing I can think of in this kind of epidemic that we have now with um, that combination of pain and obesity and chronic pain. No, I agree. I totally agree. I mean, I think that, you know, we do have to continue to move. We, you know, so obviously we haven't figured out what all the answers, but we're trying to move, trying to, you know, shift how we approach pain. And one of the things is to sort of say we need that. We need to have the polls open 20, you know, all year round. And we need to have access to, to um, you know, water aerobics and the like. I agree. Totally. You know, in workers' comp, I had a patient who was on 3,000 milligrams of oxycodone which is $9,000 worth of, you know, it's an annuity if he was so inclined to sell it, right? And it's amazing that workers' comp was willing to pay $9,000 a month for this guy, but nothing for the other things I wanted to do for him. By the way, the guy's on like on a milligram of beep right now. But he's, you know, but the point is that they spend money on, on injections, spinal cord stimulators, implantable pumps, but God forbid, you know, gym privileges, you know, aerobic class, yoga, you know, mindful best stress reduction. I mean, these things, you know, are not expensive. So if we look at most of these chronic diseases as a biopsychosocial spiritual disorder, then what I want to call attention to is the spiritual dimension of treatment. And there's good science that shows that people who are actively following some spiritual faith tradition, a practice, actually do much better. So I wanted to make that comment, but then also talk about that as a antidote to living in a culture that usually um, promotes something more than just drugs but instant gratification. And most of the spiritual traditions preach something that is an antidote to that, that says there's something beyond an instant fix through buying, through any titillating pleasure that we might get. And just want to you know, get your thoughts about that, because all of my patients get a self-care prescription, 
which means that you're nurturing your body, your mind, and your spirit. And if they don't have a faith tradition, I say, well, what do you believe in? And then they sometimes just stop. Yeah. And I say, well, you be everybody believes in something. So if you're believing that there's better living through chemistry, or there's better living through a better automobile, or better living through all of those things, okay, just own that. And let's talk about, is that working for you? I do think that we do have to try to get our patients to try to find some sort of meaning in what they're experiencing. You know, sort of the, without meaning um, to suffering, we can't really survive it. I think Viktor Frankl learned that in World War, after World War II. So I think that, yes, I agree with that. Um, and um, how do we, I think it's good to acknowledge it and in our practices incorporate it, but it's, you know, how to do it is more variable. I've really not much to add to that, except I read a book a couple of years ago that really, uh, some of you in the addiction field may have heard of George Valent. He's a Harvard professor, and it's called Spiritual Evolution, and it really had a very large impact on me, how we're hardwired. You know, I grew up in this neurotic Jewish Freudian thing where you want to kill your father and sleep with your mother, which I never did. Um, and as opposed to the positive psychology and spiritual evolution, which has nothing to do with religion, but could be part, it's the best part of all religions, but it's overlooked by many you who know, practice some of them. Uh, you know, so if you have a faith-based thing, wonderful, but if you don't, and even if you're an atheist, but you have some quality of spirituality, it's really important. I suggest reading that book, Spiritual Evolution. Thank you so much. I think that's a great place for us to um, stop our morning.